In all the years we've been on the air, we've never come across a character quite like Ira Einhorn. At times, he seemed like a drugged-out hippie lunatic. Other times, he seemed like a visionary genius who would take the world by storm. But no one could have expected that he would see the world while he was running from the law, and that a cop from Philadelphia would follow him to the ends of the earth. Our correspondent, Lennon Ozizwe, has been following this incredible story. What a long, strange trip it's been. When you thought of the hippie movement in Philadelphia, you thought of Ira Einhorn. He was a leader in the counterculture movement, dropping acid, protesting the Vietnam War, and organizing Philadelphia's first Earth Day. Occasionally I look, I like what I see. The Ira was a combination of uh, Abby Hoffman and Allen Ginsberg and uh, hippie statesmen all rolled into one. No matter how outrageous, when the age of Aquarius intellectual spoke, people listened. The high and the high and mighty were spellbound by its futuristic visions of the paranormal, computer science, and environmental causes. Ira saw himself as a global figure, and an important figure in the culture. Uh, he called himself a planetary ensign because he felt that he was a catalyst to bring together people with important ideas. With my connections and your resources, it is possible to link these new personal computers into a kind of revolutionary information network along the lines predicted by McLuhan and Fuller. As we showed you in our recreation, as following transcended the worlds of business, you move your company into the new age. And bull sessions. Now in campus, though, physics, the interrelationship between quantum mechanics and consciousness becomes more apparent. His fans would gather anywhere to soak up his philosophy. But that's the whole point. There is no difference between the microcosm and the macrocosm. And he was able to kind of dial your inner soul, so to speak. He was able to click in, you know, that little combination that everybody has. You know, I was the star of his own soap opera. Everybody else was an extra. <laughs> and with women, everybody else. I mean, his ego just filled the room with anything he came into. So with women, they were just objects, you know, and, uh, and he used them and he treated them as that way. Here, Ira takes the concept of making a woman an object to the extreme in this student film. By the late 70s, the real woman in his life was Holly Maddox. She was extremely giving, very loving, um, always had a place in her heart for you. And if she didn't know where that place was, she would search herself to find just where you fit in. But the couple would not live happily ever after. Einhorn was abusive. In 1977, Holly decided to leave him. They did fight again. Holly reiterated that she was going to start a relationship with someone new, and Ira was very unhappy about that. And that was the last anyone heard of Holly. If Einhorn knew where Holly was, he wasn't sane. And in the wake of her disappearance, his counterculture fame was growing. After Holly disappeared, you know, Ira's life really exploded in a positive way. In the sense that he was starting to lecture at Harvard, dealing with parapsychology, setting up a network of computer scientists. He was the first really to use computers in a positive way, organizing exhibitions in Philadelphia. He really was, his life was really taking off in a very respectable way. But he was living with a terrible secret, a mystery that would take police 18 months to discover when they searched his apartment. I got a warrant to search your premises. Mind if I throw some clothes on? Police would finally uncover the mystery of Holly's disappearance when they searched Einhorn's closet. Got a key for this? No. Well, I'm gonna have to break it. Well, you're gonna have to break it. Inside the closet, police found an old trunk. When they opened it up, they found Holly's body where it had been hidden for almost two years. She'd been beaten to death, like we found then Holly. kept out of sight of friends Einhorn invited Under to his apartment. Helen Holly Maddox. You have the right to remain silent? Yes, I would do that. I had spent many nights and times and days sitting and talking to Ira about the philosophy and parapsychology and reading and talking and, uh, about these subjects. And now to know that 10 feet away, with his body, it was, it was a very unnerving feeling. 
In spite of the horrific crime, many of Philly's power elite rallied around Einhorn. He was represented by powerhouse attorney Arlen Specter. He would go on to become a U.S. senator. Other rich and famous friends also came to his aid, such as Seagram's heiress Barbara Bromfman, who had her family's billion-dollar fortune at her disposal. Investigators say she helped bail Einhorn out on $40,000, but he did not stick around for the trial. In January 1981, he hit the road. That was his attitude, essentially. It's, it's like, uh, you know, I'll take off to Europe. It's going to be too much trouble for them to bother looking for me. He was kind of an arrogant fugitive. An arrogant fugitive who was not counting on the tenacious Rich de Benedetto, the head of the fugitive squad of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, a stranger who had become his nemesis and opponent in a global chess game seeped in international intrigue that would last 16 years. It began when Einhorn fled to Canada, then England, and then on to Ireland. Just weeks after jumping bail, Einhorn was in Dublin, knocking on the door of Professor Dennis Weir. He asked for a room to rent, and unbelievably, he introduced himself as Ira Einhorn. He moved into his new place with a new girlfriend. He said he was writing a book, which is something people often come to Ireland to do. Einhorn also told the Harvard-educated professor that he'd been in some minor trouble, but Weir realized there was something more to it when he told Einhorn that he and his wife were going to visit the United States. He became very agitated and uh, muttered something about us not uh, telling the authorities about his presence in, in this country. And at that stage, we decided that possibly he was in serious trouble. So the couple notified the authorities when they got to America. They'd soon find out just how hospitable the Emerald Isle could be for a fugitive. The weather certainly didn't draw Ira Einhorn to Dublin, but investigators say a legal loophole did. When he first started on the run, the United States did not have an extradition treaty with Ireland. He's within full sight. Right. You know exactly where he is. You know his address. You have his phone number, and you can't touch him. Right. By the end of 1991, Einhorn moved on to one of Dublin's most exclusive neighborhoods. The, his house was directly at the back of ours, and I, I'd met him at a party, and uh, he was an interesting guy to talk to. He, Jonathan uh, Philbin Bowman is now a television game show and host and a newspaper columnist. But back in 1981, he was a teenager who found Einhorn to be eccentric and offbeat with a guru-like following. We're talking about... Um, Slightly fringy alternative people. They probably thought that um, smoking dope on a Tuesday evening and discussing dead German philosophers was almost the height of, you know, existence. For years, Einhorn lived just a half a block away from the American embassy, where friends say he was brazen enough to show his face at parties there. But now he went by a new name, Ben Moore. That's how psychologist Hank Harrison got to know him. Ben Moore was based on Benjamin Moore paint that covers, paint that covers, and he was going to also call himself Sherman Williams at one time. It covers the world, you know. Hank says the cosmic guru was still not very enlightened when it came to women. He says Einhorn used and abused them. Well, I saw him actually slap a woman in front of me. I saw him... Uh, uh, commandeer a car and take a car away from a woman. I, I've seen him uh, yell at women, and he'll, but he's very charming, he'll... But he says he was charming to women and men. He had frequent breakfast meetings with Einhorn at this local hangout. Harrison even brought his daughter out to dinner with them, a daughter who grew up to be musician, actress, and cover girl for this month's Bizarre magazine, Courtney Love. He would have spaghetti feeds at his house. Some of these spaghetti feeds turned into sex parties at some stage. I didn't stay for those incidents. I wanted to make that very clear. Einhorn's girlfriend also didn't stick around. She left Einhorn and became De Benedetto's reluctant source. She told the investigator about a friend of Einhorn who was a bookseller named Eugene Mallon. De Benedetto had detective friends visiting Ireland check it out, but Mallon wasn't talking. This guy Mallon got real nasty with them, trying to throw them out of the store. And he wasn't so friendly when we caught up with him. Did you have something to hide? I thought Ira Einhorn was your friend. 
Einhorn's former girlfriend gave De Benedetto another lead that Einhorn said he had a billion dollar benefactor in Barbara Bronfman. She, in effect, admitted that she'd been sending him money. She, she actually had gone over and met with him in Dublin, and she claims that the last place she knew where he was was that he had been in Sweden. We got information and requests from Interpol Washington because there was information that this Ira Einhorn or Ben Moore, whatever he was called, uh, was staying, living in Stockholm. Now this would prove to be an ideal hideaway and not just because the land and people are gorgeous. Well, virtually everyone here speaks English. And there was also the matter of Annika Flodine. A Swedish woman who we tracked down who fit the profile of Einhorn women. Attractive, slim, with long hair, and money. But she claimed they were no more than friends, even though they lived together in this building, just four blocks from the police station. In a sense, he was living right under your noses. In a way, yes, he was. He was too close <laughs> to be seen. In 1988, Swedish authorities were tipped off that Einhorn was there. He got wind of it and moved on without Annika. What were you able to figure out after talking to Annika? She was not cooperative at all. She didn't want to talk about it. We just let her sit for a while. But I felt he would go back to England because he had had a lot of friends there in the past. And uh, we started concentrating on England again through Scotland Yard. Now, we also found out that he went to see a famous British pop star who's been identified as Peter Gabriel. The pop musician had come to know Einhorn through his ideas of the paranormal. Einhorn had his private number and arranged a meeting when he reportedly asked for money. Then he took off before De Benedetto could move in. All these years, wasn't he saying, I'm smarter than all of you? Well, I think essentially that was his attitude. You know, one of his friends told me once, you know, you're never going to catch him because he's too smart for you. And, uh, I gotta thank his friend, because that helped me, motivate me even more to find them. De Benedetto keyed into one of Einhorn's motivations, women. They helped fuel his run, and ultimately one woman would help lead to his capture. We'll show you how not just America, but the world fought back to capture the unicorn when we come back. At days Einhorn case. What started out as a well-hidden crime in Philadelphia had now become an international manhunt. As we just showed you, after Einhorn beat his girlfriend to death, we tracked him to Canada, England, Ireland, and finally Sweden. But as police were closing in, Einhorn went on the run again. That's where Lena Nozizwe picks up the story. In 1993, 12 years after Einhorn ran from justice, he was convicted of murder in absentia in Philadelphia and sentenced to life in prison. That same year, he made his next move to France. His cozy new hideout was in the land of Cognac and Bordeaux. America's Most Wanted obtained these records that show Einhorn was now going by the name of his old bookseller friend, Eugene Mallon. And he wasn't alone. The woman he called his wife had a familiar name, Annika. Their home was in Champagne Mouton, population 1,029. Annika mastered French well enough to venture into the city for shopping, oh, la, la. No. while Einhorn mostly stayed home and wrote. Local architect Daniel Antoine knew him as a vieux babacool, an old hippie. So your take on Eugene, Mallon, and Annika? Well, a very nice couple. I mean, very quiet and, and very pleasant to... to to talk to him, well, Eugene, now uh, Ira, uh, was a very kind person. When they last spoke this summer, Einhorn told Antoine he was looking for a book publisher. Little did he know, the final dramatic chapter of his life on the run was about to unfold. Thousands of miles away, De Benedetto was pressing for more information about Annika. His theory was, find Annika, find Einhorn. 
För några veckor sedan berättade vi om den amerikanske styckmördaren Aira Einhorn. Police also enlisted Afterlist, the Swedish version of America's most wanted, to join the international hunt. Världen slår tillbaka. The world fights back. But the ultimate tip came after De Benedetto pressed Interpol Stockholm for more information about Annika. So I, I passed the request to the specialists, and during these inquiries, they found that Annika Flodin wanted her Swedish driving license to be changed to a French driving license. And she gave an address in France where the letter should be sent to her. The name on the letter was Annika Flodin. Annika Flodin Mallon. De Benedetto was closing in once again on his elusive fugitive. But would something as simple as a driver's license put an end to Einhorn's 16-year run? And Richard Benedetto, he said that this was the best lead he had had for years. And it turned out to be correct. At that point, there was no doubt in my mind that she was with him. So we then open up an investigation through Interpol France. It was uh, his destiny. He had to, to finish in France. Guy Zapata, head of the French Judicial Police in Bordeaux, would now take the baton in a manhunting marathon that was on the final leg of a 16-year run. We knew it was very, it will be very difficult to coach him because uh, he escaped uh, from two or three countries in, uh, in Europe and in the, the USA first. So we had to, to work with a uh, uh, secret discussion. Champagne Mouton is so small that investigators had to come up with a special strategy of making sure they had their man. So what they did for surveillance was dress up as fishermen. As it turns out, Ira Einhorn would be their catch of the day. The morning of June, Friday 13th, 1997, Zapata led about a dozen armed, bulletproof, vest-wearing judicial police into the home of a sleeping Ira Einhorn. We went in the house quickly, rapidly. We say we are the police and we are coming to, to catch him and he doesn't move. He was surprised. Finally, after 16 years, the long-haired guru turned globetrotting fugitive was now just a white-haired inmate. But even after he was busted, he kept insisting he was Eugene Mallon. And when they took him before the French court and asked him his name, he said Eugene Mallon, and he gave a little smile. In other words, acknowledging that the game was up. The man who was backed by the rich and powerful was finally caught by the Philadelphia investigator who didn't have much more than a telephone line to reel in his globetrotting fugitive. I think it's a good day for the justice system today. And uh, I guess persistence pays off. Einhorn now sits in Gladignon prison near Bordeaux, where he continues to inspire devotion and loyalty from those closest to him, including Annika. Has Annika ever explained to you why she would go on the run with somebody accused and convicted of murder? Well, I think that certainly she loves it. She loves him. And second, I think she's sure he's not guilty. Well, we're going to try to, to help him not to be ex extra extradé, as, as we say. Extradited. Extradited. Yeah. A smiling and even laughing Annika attended Einhorn's extradition hearing in Bordeaux last week. She may be smiling because the French lawyers representing Einhorn are convinced the French courts will release him. And maybe that's why Einhorn himself was smiling when we got a glimpse of him last week, perhaps savoring the possibility his long, strange trip may never end. Boy, Rich Benedetto's one good cop. But I can't believe, after all that, the French courts are thinking of releasing Einhorn. Here's the deal. Remember how Einhorn was convicted in absentia because he ran? Well, in France, when you're convicted in absentia and you're captured again, you get a new trial. And because Einhorn won't get a new trial here, they're afraid to extradite him. The French judges will announce their decision on September 23rd. Strange justice, I think. And I promise you, we'll be watching. Up next.